Take your Bibles, turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to read verses 7 through 21 together. 1 John 4, 7 through 21. This is now the word of God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we do come to worship. You are indeed a great God and your name will be great among the nations. You are to be exalted and praised, and someday every knee will bow to you and give homage to you and give tribute to you and worship you. Even your enemies and rebels will worship you. And Father, we have the privilege now, today, as you're redeemed, to worship you ahead of time, to worship you in this world. And we pray, God, that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart are pleasing in your sight. We so long for you to be honored. Father, we come to a portion now where we open your word. We do believe that you have the right to speak to us. We do believe that you have the right for your word to be opened, to be examined, to be proclaimed, to be explained, to be meditated upon, to be obeyed, to be honored. And Father, this is central for us, that we said in humble submission to hear what you would say, to yield our lives in submission to your perfect will, to have you speak to us and transform us and guide us. Lord, this matters to us, and we are so thankful for the privilege. And I pray this morning that as we read your word, that your spirit would grant us understanding, that we would know what it is you're saying, and that, God, you would also grant us faith to believe and wills to respond and strength to obey, that, God, we might obey you and honor you in this world. Speak to us now, and we ask it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the New Testament, the church is described by various metaphors, and if you were to go to run them through your mind and say all the different ways the church is described or illustrated in the New Testament, some would immediately come to your mind. We think of Paul calling the church God's building. He says that we are built on the foundation of the apostles, and Christ Jesus is himself the cornerstone, and we are God's building. You might think of the analogy that we are considered to be the flock of God, of which Jesus is the chief shepherd. We are the sheep of his pasture. We see the church referred to as a body, Jesus Christ, of course, being the head. We think of Paul's analogy of how we are all members of one another. We're not all eyes or ears or hands or feet, but we are a body of Christ in the world. Certainly, we think of the analogy of the church as a bride. Christ is, in fact, our husband. Many analogies and metaphors in the New Testament that describe the church and the way she relates to Christ and the way that she operates in the world. But none of those are the most popular in the New Testament. There is one metaphor or analogy, however you want to put it, that rises above the rest in popularity that is used far more times than any of the other analogies in the Bible. And that is very simply as the church described as a family. 
Jesus, of course, being our elder brother. Alexander Strach wrote, The reality of this strong, familial community supersaturates the New Testament. The New Testament writers most commonly refer to the believers as brethren. Peter refers to the worldwide Christian community as the brotherhood. The terms brethren, brother, or sister occur approximately 250 times throughout the New Testament. He'd go on to point out these realities. The early Christians met in homes. They shared material possessions. They ate together. They greeted one another with a holy kiss. They showed hospitality. They cared for widows. When appropriate, they disciplined their members. It's a repeated analogy that the church is a family, that we are a brotherhood, that Christ is our elder brother, that God is our father. And so we get throughout the pages of Scripture not only the reality that we are a family, but that as a family we are to love one another. We are to love our brothers and love our sisters. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let love of the brethren continue. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, Now, as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. For indeed, you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all Macedonia, but we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. In 1 Peter 1, Peter says, Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. We're certainly called to emulate the elder brother, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself, who left the glories of heaven, who laid down his life that his brothers might be saved. And that's at the forefront of what John speaks of this morning. As John writes throughout his epistle, he makes it clear what is genuine and what is not genuine Christianity. We've talked quite a bit about that. John also at the same time strives to provide assurance to those who are genuine believers that they would know they are children of God. And in that effort, no topic is more important to John than brotherly love. In his desire to expose what is genuine Christianity and in his desire to expose assurance of genuine Christianity, no topic weighs more to him than that of love. That's the big one. This is the one he brings out. This is the one by which he will measure genuine Christianity. This is the one by which he will give you the strongest case for assurance. This command above all others is the one John rests on. It's his strongest evidence to argue regarding genuine Christianity. And so we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at this passage. It's probably the most famous in 1 John. And this one who defined himself as the apostle whom Jesus loved. To him, this is the big one. I don't know how long it will take us to study it, but I'm going to give you the three points here at the beginning. I'm sort of I'm going to give you those three big outline headings of 1 John 4, 7 through 21, because you need to read this during the week. And you need to study it, and you need to ponder it and meditate upon it and see if you can glean what God is bringing to you from it. Even on your bulletin, I gave you sort of a, a John outline on the front of it that you can look at. John doesn't write linear. That's what makes John difficult to understand sometimes. In, in our Western culture, everything's linear. You know, Roman numeral 1, A, B, C, Roman numeral 2, A, B. John doesn't write like that. John's an Eastern writer. If you go to Africa, this is how Africans think. He, John's circular. They don't get to the point, they circle everything over and over and over and over and over until finally you back up and look at the circle and say, oh, I see what you're circling. Well, clearly John's circling love one another, but he circles it in a, in a massive amount of ways. So um, I want to give you sort of a, a breakdown first, and you study this for the next few weeks, and we'll learn about love together. But these are the three points I'm going to give you over the course of the next few weeks. One is atonement deserves it. That's brotherly love. You don't have to put this up yet, Chris. We're not there yet. Atonement deserves it. You're going to see verses 7 through uh, 11 here, that because we've been atoned for by Christ, we deserve our, our brothers deserve to be loved by us. The second point you're going to see is that assurance depends on it. You're going to see this in verse 12. I don't remember where it stops. You're going to see it in there somewhere. Assurance depends on it. If you want assurance before God, you need to have brotherly love. And the third point you're going to see at the end is that authenticity demands it. You, you want to be an authentic Christian. Good luck being an authentic Christian without brotherly love. You're not going to be able to do it. And so these are the three points that John's going to take us to. But as I said, he's going to go circular as we go. And so it's not always going to be a nice, neat outline. But these are the three that rise to the front. Well, this morning, I want to talk about this first one. So here's point number one. When we talk about brotherly love, atonement deserves it. So let's read verses 7 through 11 again. And I want you to see John just circling this idea. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this, the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is a reality that John is going to talk about, that brotherly love is the most fitting response to the love which Christ has shown us. If I want to put it in secular terms so that you can sort of uh, analogize it a little bit in your mind, let's say that you determine you and your spouse are going to go and adopt a child. You already have some kids at home, but you're going to go adopt another one. And you go into a place and you see a child that's in pretty difficult circumstances. Maybe you're going to go to the girls and boys ranch and you're going to find a child that's been pulled out of a, of a horrible home. It's going to have been pulled out of horrible circumstances. And this child has come to this foster care facility and you go and you determine, I'm, I'm going to adopt this child and I'm going to bring this child into my family. I'm going to give this child my name. I'm going to prepare and provide for this child and I'm going to care for them and I'm going to love them and I'm going to introduce them into the family. So you go into that situation and you invite that child in and you adopt them to be your own. You're going to have a lot of plans and dreams and hopes for that child, no doubt. But at the top of your list, number one is that you hope when you bring this child from the outside into your family, that they will be loved in the middle of your family, right? I mean, what do you expect and hope for from your other children, your natural children? Do you want them to always treat that kid as an outcast? Well, you're the adopted one, right? No, your main objective, I know, you'll have a lot of plans and dreams and hopes for all of them, certainly, but top on your list will be that your natural children will love and accept this adopted child, and that this adopted child will love and accept your natural children, and that someday you'll reach a point where they all feel equally like your children, that they all love one another as brothers and sisters without any division, without any discord, without any pecking order, and you as a parent will say, I just want you to love each other. I mean, if you had a natural sibling, your mom probably said that to you at one point or time. My sister, who was incredibly difficult to love growing up, right? Why can't you just love each other? I wish she listened. You know, she would, she'd, she'd get convicted by that. So I, I wish you just loved each other. Can't you all just get along, right? I mean, how many moms have said that sort of thing? Why can't you just love them? Why can't you just get along? Why can't you this? That's top on the list. So from a very familiar and family type aspect here, you understand that when God goes through the effort to redeem a lost child into the family to adopt them as one of his own, chief and top of his concern is very simple that those whom he have adopted will love each other, that they'll be the family, that they'll be in love with one another. Not only then is the expectation of God that we love God, we certainly love him for the gift of adoption, but that we also love the other kids he adopts. That's important to him. And looking at our text, I would first point out to you then what you need to understand. We were saying that atonement should motivate love. Atonement deserves brotherly love. Well, I want you to look at the words that John bookends this first thought with. Verses 7 through 11 is this first thought. And notice the first word he uses in verse 7. What is it? Beloved. And notice the word he begins verse 11 with. What is it? Beloved, there's, there's a bookend going on here, okay? I hope you understand. In, in John's great circle, John is trying to point out to something to you that you would grasp about yourself, and that is that before God, you were who? Your beloved. God has given you a distinction, agapeteo. It literally means loved ones. That's who you are. You are loved by God. 1 John 3, 1, seeing how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. That's your distinction. That's your title. You are loved by God. Paul does a wonderful job speaking of this great love in Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Notice the wording that Paul uses here, that God certainly was merciful, but God had great love and then God demonstrated or expressed or put that love on us to the degree that even when we were dead, he made us alive. But notice how he describes it. He made us alive with Christ, and he raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. That is to say that God took what was only Christ and added us to it. We share in Christ's inheritance. We share in Christ's Father. 
Christ has loved us. In, in one sense, you could almost look at us as usurpers on his inheritance, as those who have come in and taken what is his, as those who have come in and tried to share in his family rights and in his family inheritance, and we're going to be a part of the Father's love, and yet we are brought in with him. We, we get that same love from the Father, adopted in to be brothers with Christ, shown the love of God. We are his children adopted into his family, forgiven of our trespasses, endowed with his inheritance, filled with his spirit. Paul says, you are the beloved. You are the loved ones. And that's a reality not only that John will prove in these next five verses. He's going to prove to you that you are the beloved. But it's also the reality that John's going to use to prove to you and to motivate you to love your brother. He's going to show you that because you are loved, you should love. In fact, that's what John says first. Look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. It's a simple command, isn't it? Let us love one another. I don't know if there's another command in the Bible that's more widely known. It, is that the first time anybody's read that? Does anybody say, really? I did not. That's the first I've heard of it. I did not know that we were supposed to love one another. Is anybody genuinely shocked or surprised that we just read a command in the Bible that you're to love one another? Nobody is, right? You've heard this. This is, this is one of the quick ones. This is one of the early ones. You know we're to love one another. And yet, I think I would probably be safe in saying that though it is widely known, few commands are more disregarded than this one. Why? Because it's difficult. It is so hard to love one another. In fact, as you'll see as John works us through this entire text, the only possible way that you can do it is through the power of God. The only way that you can love your brother the way God commands you to love your brother is if God's spirit dwells within you. You're going to see that work out. But this morning, let's just talk about first how God has atoned for our sin, how God has loved us, and how that love deserves a response of love from us. So verse 7 still. Beloved, let us love one another. And then you see the word for. This is an explanation word. Why? Because love is from God. Now, love here is spoken of as a gift. It is a gift to us. And first, you're going to be tempted to apply that as a benefit you have received from God. And that's true, you have. You have received the gift of God's love to you. It is a benefit you enjoy. It has come from God to us. But what John is trying to point out to you, it is not simply a gift which you receive and enjoy, but love from God is also a provision that you distribute to others. It is something which God has given you and he is asking you to share it. It's something God has first provided you with that he's asking you to pass along to somebody else. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? How? Because God has given you the love to love with. You give your kid a cookie and then you tell him, now give some of that cookie to your brother, right? This is the idea. It didn't originate with you. It didn't start with you. God gave it to you, and certainly you enjoy it and benefit from it, but there is an expectation that comes with it that you also will share that love beyond yourself. And by the way, the love we're speaking of here is not worldly love. It's not human love. It's the love of God. It's the love which only comes from God. It's that agapeo love. It's not worldly fondness. It's not worldly craving. It's not emotional attraction. It's not a chemical thing, and it's not natural to you. It's not natural in our world. You can't learn it in school. You can't achieve it through hard work. It comes from a supernatural origin. It only comes from one place. This love with which we are required to love one another only comes from God. You can't get it anywhere else. If I'm to give it to somebody, I only get it from him. It's the only place it comes from. And so first we learn that the capacity for the kind of love which we're to love our brethren only comes from God. In fact, to prove that this love only comes from God, John says, in fact, this love is a fruit, is an evidence of genuine salvation. You see it in verse 8, or really still verse 7. He says, for love is from God, and everyone who loves, that is to say, everyone who loves with this kind of love, does so because they are born of God and knows God. And the one who does not love like this does not know God, for God is loved. You see what he's saying? This love is divine in origin. It comes only from God. And, and the fact that it comes only from God makes it a credible reality that if you have it, there's only one place you could have gotten that. If you love your brother this way, that is evidence you are a child of God because you couldn't have gotten that love anywhere else. And if you don't love your brother like this, this is evidence that you don't know God because if you did, you'd have it. 
and you would use it. Does that make sense? John is saying this is criteria even for salvation, which he'll circle back to again. But the reality right off the forefront that I want you to see is that God has shown tremendous love for us, and that love which he has given us was intended by him to be shared with others. And that is a mark of Christianity. But that opens up for us a few questions. All right then, what does it look like? I mean, you're telling me this love comes only from God. It's not a love that I can get from the world. It's not a love I can learn in school or work to obtain. Well, how do I know if I have it? What what are you talking about? What does this love look like? How will I know when it's being shown? How will I know when it's being given? So John here wants to show you this kind of love. Not, and we hear the world talk about love all the time, how love is good and love is important and everybody should love. But what are you talking about when you say that? He's not talking about what the world boasts of love. He's talking about God's love. And you see that love in verse 9. This is a very important verse. They're all important verses. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. There's a mouthful here, but let's pay attention. God's love, John says, was manifested. You see that? Important word, manifested. The Greek word there means to make visible or to realize. It especially speaks of something that was unknown. It only came from God. The world doesn't know it. The world doesn't comprehend it. But God has made it known. God has manifested his love. Notice also that God's love has been manifested in us. Now that's different from the verse we're common, commonly associated with. Romans 5, 8, we read, but God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're familiar with that verse. That God put on display his love so that we could see it. How did he do that? with the cross, right? The cross was a demonstration of God's love pointed toward you so that you might see it, so that you might rationalize and comprehend what is the love of God. It's a demonstration for you to see. That's not what John speaks of. He speaks of something different. John says God's love has been manifested in us. It's not just demonstrated to us, but he speaks of love being made visible inside of us. Now, I certainly never want to take my eyes off of the cross, but John says that I can now realize God's love through something that he has done in my life. Now, on one hand, I say, how do you know God loves me? And we say, well, the cross demonstrates God loves me. We know that. We we know the story. But we also now say with John that God has also manifested his love within us. He's done something in us to show his love for us. What is that? Look at it, verse 9. Well, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. You say, by what? That God has sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, when you read that verse and you ask the question, what is it that God has done in me that shows his love for me? What has he done? And you read verse 9 and you read it and ponder on it for a second. What is it that God has done in you that manifests or reveals that he loves you. The means by which God did it, by the way, is that he sent his only begotten son into the world. That's how he did it. But what exactly did he do? And the answer is very simply this. He made you alive. He made you alive. Do you see it? God's love was manifested in us that through sending his son into the world, we might live through him. God's love is now visible in us by the reason of the life that God has given us. We're not referring to physical life here. All men have that. We're talking about the new, spiritual, abundant, eternal life, which comes to us only through Christ. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes, that's the redeemed, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Life that lasts for eternity. That's what you get. John 4.10, Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. 
John 6, 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. John 8, 12, Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have gobs of it. Have it abundantly. We read a moment ago in Ephesians 2, verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. When Jesus came to this earth, it was not primarily to be just a model of good behavior. He didn't come to improve living standards. He didn't come to educate the ignorant or to bring political reform or social justice. Jesus, at its forefront, came to make dead men alive. That's what he did. To raise the dead to life. You say, what do you mean dead men? Ephesians 2. And you were dead. Dead how? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. We're talking about spiritual death here. In which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. You were dead in the sin that you lived in. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. What is this death we speak of? Well, people are spiritually dead. They follow the worldly pattern of Satan. That's what they do. They they do what Satan does. He's the leader. They follow his objective. They follow his rationale. They follow his mindset. They follow his logic. They follow his deeds. They you know, commit lust of the flesh. They indulge in them. You know, they do what makes the flesh feel good. That, that's because they're spiritually dead. And they're children of wrath. Uh, they're doomed to destruction. Uh, that's what it means to be spiritually dead. It indicates no love for God, no understanding of the things of God, no desire for the things of God. There there is no spiritual life within them. They just live purely and totally in the flesh. As Titus put it, their God God is their stomach. If it feels good, they want to do it. If it tastes good, they want to eat it. They, They just live this entire life not for God or the glory of God or the satisfaction of God or the joy of God. They live this entire life for what makes the flesh feel good. They they really don't think beyond that. I, I want A comfortable flesh, a happy flesh, a gratified flesh, a feel-good flesh. I want everything in my surroundings to do that which makes my flesh happy. That's it. That's spiritually dead. There is no spiritual awakening. There is no spiritual life. There is no thought given to spiritual things and to the joy and the satisfaction of God. They're dead. And Christ came into this world to take those who were dead like that and make them alive. It occurs through him. Now, we've repeatedly said that God's love is a redeeming love. And that God's love is a transforming love. We know that. Here you find out God's love is a resurrecting love. It is not empty infatuation. It's certainly not apathetic approval. I just want you to be happy. It is not an enablement of sinful desires. It's not what God did. It's not what Christ did. Christ came and approached us in our sin and made us alive that we might be different. That we might be new. God did this for those whom he saved. He sent his son to raise us from the dead. Colossians 1.13 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son. That's the love of God. Romans 6.12 Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I want to illustrate this a little more distinctly. Turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 4. What you're going to get here is a very graphic distinction between the difference of those who are dead and those who are alive. Paul, in effect, is going to set a spiritually dead man next to a spiritually alive man, and he's going to let you see the contrast. He's going to let you see the difference. Hopefully this will help you see that. Ephesians 4, verse 17. This is a lengthy passage. We're not going to dwell on it long, but I just want you to get the analogy and the contrast. The obvious difference here, Ephesians 4, 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you, that would be believers, walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind. So we're talking about the redeemed versus the world. Regarding the world, he says, they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, 
have given themselves over to sensuality, that is whatever feels good, for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. That is, there is no limit to the amount of sinful debauchery they will participate in. There is no limit extreme that is too far gone that they won't do it if it feels good. They've given themselves over to it, and they've done it greedily. They want more. That's the world. They just run after sin faster and faster and faster. Then you get the redeemed. Paul says in verse 20, But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard of him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus. If you're a Christian, you didn't, you're not like this, Paul says. Verse 22, That in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceits. And you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Whereas they are sensuality and debauchery and impurity, you are righteousness and holiness and truth. It's an obvious distinction. To which Paul then says in verse 25, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that we'll have something to share with one who is in need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do you see the difference? One lies, one speaks truth, one is filled with anger, one is not. One steals, one labors, one is you know, filthy mouth, the other one doesn't let unwholesome words come out of their mouth. I mean, it's just an obvious distinction. Paul says in verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Chapter 5, Be imitators of God. As beloved children, walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, and an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who has an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You see the distinction again. Those aren't saved people, Paul says. They're dead spiritually. Verse 6, let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. They're called sons of disobedience. Therefore, he says, do not be partakers with them. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness of truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do you get the distinctions? I mean, they're obvious. You have one who is spiritually dead, who just loves sin and what feels good, and his mouth is filthy, and he's greedy, and he steals, and he lies, and he loses his temper, and he doesn't care about the things of God. Uh, that's the unredeemed. That's spiritually dead. And then you have the one who walks in love and truth and forgiveness and mercy and controls his tongue and doesn't steal and doesn't lie and controls his temper. I mean, it's a totally different distinction. You understand the difference then between spiritual life and spiritual death. And the question I have for you is, why are you no longer like them? Why don't you fly off at the mouth? And why aren't you greedy? And why don't you steal? And why don't you lie? And why don't you do all those things? Why don't you gratify the flesh every moment of the day? Why do you not do that? Because God has loved you. Because in love, God did a work in you. God made you alive when you were dead. When you were wallowing in the filth, God reached in and pulled you out. When you were wallowing in the mud with the prodigal son, God reached in and grabbed you and pulled you out of that pig pen. Psalm 40 says that, right? He pulled me out of the miry clay and he set my feet upon a rock and he put a new song in my mouth. He loved you. Instead of leaving you in your filth to wallow in shame and ultimately be judged for all eternity, God demonstrated love. He manifested love in you while when you were dead, he made you alive. That's difference. You see that love in you. God wouldn't let you go. What a remarkable love. That's remarkable in and of itself, but it gets even better. Now look at verse 10, back in 1 John 4. Verse 10, and this is love, John says, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, again, if you want the full effect of what John is saying here, in verse 10, you need to pull out the two points that talk about you. Uh, there's two descriptors where you are described in verse 10. The first is, not that we loved God. And the second is, for our sins. That means that God loved you when you were a sinner who did not love God. That's when he loved you. God did not respond to our love with his own. That's not what happened. That's why you love a dog, right? Because the dog loves you. 
That's why you love it. Can't help it because that dog just loves you, right? The dog just thinks you hung the moon. It's easy to love something that loves you. That's not what God did. We didn't love God, John says. God initiated his love to those who didn't love him. Not only that, we, God didn't respond to people that were doing their best. It wasn't like we were in the mud saying, oh, I want out. I just want to walk in a manner that pleases God. I want to do good. I want to get out of this mud hole. I want to live right. I want to get clean. That's not what we were. You want to know what we were? We were in the mud hole doing the backstroke, right? Ooh, I love the mud, right? And God was saying, come out, and we were saying, beat it. I don't want out of the mud. I love the mud, right? And we just waller in it and roll in it. That's why Peter says a sow after washing returns to wallow in the mire. That's what we were. We didn't want out. We didn't want to be pulled out. In fact, many of you and me were pulled out kicking and screaming, right? Because the first time you sat in church and the gospel was preached and you were convicted, did you just fly down the aisle? No, you held on to your mud hole, didn't you? Right there on the back of that pew, you're like, I'm not leaving the mud, right? I don't want to go. Everybody will see how muddy I am. I don't want to walk down there. I like the mud. I want to stay in it. I don't want to let it. That's what we do. We fight to keep it. Point is, you weren't looking for God. He came looking for you. You weren't loving him. He was loving you. You weren't trying to be righteous. He was making you righteous. He loved you in spite of your unloveliness. That's the reality. He saved you in spite of the fact that you almost had to come kicking and screaming. He loved you in spite of you. You see that first. And then you ask, well, what love did he show us when we were unloving? Verse 10. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. That was first. And, <laughs> as if there could be more, sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. There's that word we love again, propitiation. Haliasmos. It's actually the, in the Septuagint. Remember, that's the word they use for mercy seat. It, it means appeasement or satisfaction. It speaks of settling down or relieving the wrath of God. So follow me here. God looks upon this world and he sees rebellious sinners who deserve his wrath and judgment. And everything in his holiness would rise up to crush them. I mean, whenever I was, I don't know, I was in high school and my grandparents had septic tank problems. And everybody relishes those types of moments. And so we pull the lid off of the top of the septic tank and my grandpa, you would just have to know him. He just always had to do a little more than needed to be done. And, I mean, we tore up more fence posts and more equipment because he was going to try one more thing, you know. And I don't remember exactly what led him right to the edge of the septic tank. But he's right to the edge and he's trying to do something. And all of a sudden, you know, he loses his balance. And you're, I know the anticipation's killing you, right? And he does one of those quick super runs around the inside. You know, where, I mean, it's like he's going and he's just running the rim of that septic tank. And at the last minute, he just dives and lands on the ground. And, you know, he's safe. And we're just, what else is new? My grandma immediately responded, if he'd have fell in there, you could have just put the lid back on it. That, <laughs> that was her answer, right? Now, that's how God should have responded to us wallowing in our filth. Just put the lid on it, right? Just let it go. I mean, no more of this. They are nasty, sinful, rebellious. They love it. Put the lid on it. Leave it there. In fact, store up the lightning. Store up the thunder. Let's drown them all. Or, better yet, let's open up the ground and swallow them whole. Oh, I know. Let's send fire from heaven and incinerate them. And you say, where would you come up with crazy ideas like that? Well, from the Old Testament, because God did that to sinners. God did that in the days of Noah. God did that in the days of Moses, whenever he opened up the ground and ate up Korah and all of his rebels. He did it in Sodom and Gomorrah when he sent fire upon the earth. And I gave you a list of some of the most terrible expressions of God's wrath in the Bible. But those aren't the worst. You know what one belongs on the top of that list? The cross. No time in history did God pour out more wrath with more fury than on the cross. It is the pinnacle demonstration and display of the fury and wrath of God. It is more furious than the flood. It is more furious than the ground swallowing Korah alive. It is more furious than burning those at Sodom and Gomorrah. It is the massive outpouring of God's wrath because on the cross, Christ demonstrated and propitiated all of the wrath of God on all of the sin of all the elect for all time. In the days of Noah, God killed many people, but just those who were alive at the time. In the days of Moses, he killed Korah and Abatham and those men that 
were against Moses, but it was just them and their families. And Sodom and Gomorrah, it was a horrible judgment, but it was just those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. But this, this was all the sin committed by all the elect for all time. And it was all poured out upon Christ. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And you say, so what happened? Isaiah 53, 10 is what happened. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. You know what happened? When God saw Christ identified with sinners hanging upon the cross, God did not reluctantly crush Christ. God did not reluctantly pour wrath upon him. God's holiness was gladly satisfied. He was pleased, Isaiah says, to crush him. God poured full fury on Christ. Why? Because he's satisfying God's wrath. All the sin for all the redeemed for all time is poured on Christ. And John says, this is God's love for you revealed. That when you were sinful and you didn't love God and you wanted in your sin and God would rear back with a mighty ball of wrath to throw it in your favor, he first took Christ and put him between you and his wrath and afflicted Christ. It's that analogy of somebody getting whipped at a post and somebody else comes in and covers them and takes the whipping. This is what happened. God sent his son to bear our judgment. That's remarkable. I mean, it would be remarkable if we deserved it. Romans 5, 7 says, For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. I mean, if we were lovable, that makes a little more sense. If we were good, if we were desirable, if we loved God, if you know, we cried out and said, Oh, Daddy, please, and you know, in mercy, and tears are running down his face, and he says, Okay, I'll send my son to save you. I mean, then at least we could comprehend it. But we didn't even want him there. We didn't even want his help. Get away from me. I don't want to be saved. I don't want to be delivered. I don't want out of my sin. And even then, he sends his son to die in our stead. God's love is remarkable in that he did it for his enemies, for those who did not love him, for those who were in open rebellion against him. God sent his son to take the punishment for sinners and through his son to raise those enemies from the dead and give spiritual life to those rebels. We marvel at this. We use words for God's love like undeserved. Surely that's true. We did nothing to earn it. We use words like unrestrained, that God gave even his own son for us. We use words like unprovoked. Our love didn't motivate him. We didn't beg for it. God did it because he intended to do it. We use words like unlimited, great enough to cover all my sin and all your sin. We use words like unhindered. That is to say that even when God sent Christ and we rejected him and didn't want him, that God didn't say, well, that's it, fine. I tried and you didn't want it. I'm out of here. All the way through, all the way to the finish, all the way to the end. John 13, 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, he loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. That's remarkable, isn't it? You are the beloved. <laughs> God loved you. You didn't love God. He loved you. You didn't come for him. He came for you. You didn't satisfy him. He satisfied himself. He came in and loved you. And when you were dead in your sin, he made you alive and adopted you to be his child. God loved you. God's love was manifested by making you alive. It was demonstrated by dying in your stead. That's the love of God. Now, that's atonement. And John wants you to ponder that for a second. You have to get that point in your mind first. And then comes John's application, the main point. Verse 11, are you ready? Back to you who are the beloved, and you are. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's one of those mic drop moments, isn't it? John does. The word ought there in the Greek is ophilo, and it means to owe. Most of the time to owe money. It means to be in debt for. Romans 13, 8, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. In other words, John says, Because God loved us, you have a debt. 
You have something you owe, something that you must pay, and that is to love one another. I want you to turn to another passage. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. This passage is not about love. It's about forgiveness. But the argument and the point which John is making is identical. Matthew 18, verse 21. You'll know the story. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. Now, first off, before we bash Peter as we like to do, I want you to think about somebody who wrongs you the same way six times. I mean, somebody that, I don't know, let's say they go out this afternoon after church and take their key and run it across the hood of your car and say, please forgive me. I didn't know what I was thinking. I had a bad day, you know. Preacher went too long. I was mad, right? I just couldn't help it. I keyed your car. Would you forgive me? And you say, hey, it's all right. It'll happen to anybody. Next Sunday, they walk out key your hood again you're like well hey whoa please forgive me right I don't know what's up with me I don't know what's wrong with me I just you know you forgive me yeah I'll forgive you day three one more time right I tripped I didn't do it intentionally sorry would you please forgive me you've done that six times how many of you are still forgiven on six so when Peter says up to seven times Peter thinks he's being generous And from a man-to-man standpoint, he's being incredibly generous. You forgive somebody for something seven times, you have been incredibly generous. And Peter's feeling pretty good about himself. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? I think I've got seven in me. I think I can do it seven times. Jesus responded in verse 22, said to him, I did not say to you up to seven times. I don't know where you got seven from, Peter. You didn't get that from me. But since we're on the subject, I say up to 70 times seven. If you just did the math, you missed the point. What? 400, after 489 times, you don't even have any paint left on your hood to scratch, right? I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. You say, my brother doesn't deserve to be forgiven 490 times, really infinitely is what Jesus is saying. My brother doesn't deserve that. That's what he's saying. Well, here comes your story. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. Now stop there for a second. This guy somehow racked up a debt of 10,000 talents to the king. When I say 10,000 talents, do not think $10,000. That is not the debt here. A talent, one talent is more than 15 years wages one talent is more than 15 years wages if you do the math this guy owed 150,000 years wages I don't know what you make in a year but 150,000 years wages that means in order for this man to fulfill his promise because this man came and said have mercy with me Lord and I will repay you everything Just so that we're clear, it would take him more than 3,000 lifetimes to honor that promise. I'll pay you off in 3,000 lifetimes. It's not going to happen. You get the point? He can't do it. But the king is merciful. He felt compassion, released him, forgave him. You obviously know the story. That's God in the infinite way in which we have offended him. If you think for one second you can earn your salvation by your works or through your penance, you've got another thing coming. There has never been a more blasphemous lie created than that of purgatory that you can go to purgatory and do penance for an undisclosed period of time until you have satisfied God's wrath and then you can finally go into heaven. You ain't got enough time. Eternity doesn't hold enough time. You're never going to pay it off. That's the point. You're never going to pay it off. That's why hell is eternal, okay? It's never going to be satisfied. But this king forgave an eternal debt, 3,000 lifetimes worth of labor. And then we move on. Verse 28, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. 
and seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So this fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Now, a denarii is one day's wage. So this guy owes 100 days wages, roughly four months worth of wages. Now, I'm not going to say that's totally insignificant. I don't know what you make in a month, but if you multiply that times four and you loan that much money to somebody and they don't pay you back, I'm not saying that's nothing. It's not nothing. It's a significant wrong. It's keyed your hood six times. It, it, it's a real deal. And, and in this world, it's, it's, a, it's a massive amount. But is it unrepayable? I mean, when this guy says, I'll pay you back, there's legitimate reason to believe at least he can, right? I mean, it's not beyond the scope of human ability to pay off a four-month debt. That, that, that's not impossible. But this guy won't have compassion. He says, forget it. And he throws him in prison. Verse 31, so when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to the Lord all that had happened. Then summoning his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And in case you don't know the answer, the answer is yes. You should have. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Think about that. There's hell for you. Hand it over to the torturers until you pay back everything you owe God. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you. If each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. Now, that's about forgiveness, not about love. But go back to 1 John chapter 4 and look at verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Does that make sense? Atonement deserves it. Your brother may not deserve your love, but God definitely deserves it. In a family relationship, you may have a sibling that irritates you. Leo, do you have a sibling that irritates you? I just wondered. I just wondered. You may have one, right? A sibling that just kind of pushes your buttons. And it's difficult to love them. You may not be compelled to love them. You may not get along with them because they don't deserve it. But why do you? Because mama wants you to love them, right? You do it for mama. They don't deserve it. But mama deserves it, right? This is what we're talking about here. You beginning to see your brother and sister. Not only are you beloved, they are beloved. So look around this room just for a second. Just, you can kind of spin around and look. If you're asleep, wake up. They're fixing to be looking at you, right? Look around the room. Now, some people you see, you immediately like them, right? You're like, oh, I like that person. Yeah, they're easy to be around. I like them. Have you ever listened to a Les Heflin story? You can sit and listen to Les Heflin talk for hours. I don't even know why. It's about the grocery store. And you're like, there's no way I'm going to listen to anybody talk for more than 10 minutes about a grocery store. But you will listen to Les all day long about a grocery store because he's a good storyteller. He just tells them well. And you look around and you go, yeah, I like Les. I hang out with Les, right? And I like this person and this person. And then you're, I'll catch somebody across the church and be like, yeah, well, not them. Um. Don't get me wrong, I love them to death, right? Take a bullet for them. I just don't want to sit next to them during church. I don't want to talk to them. I, they just kind of rub me the wrong way. I just don't really like them. I mean, that's human nature, isn't it? We have that. But I want you to look at those people. And I want you just for a second to see if you can wrap your mind around how much God loves that person. It's not about how much you love them. It's not about how much they deserve your love or your forgiveness or anything like that. But can you fathom just for a second how much God loves them? We used to have to remind our older kids this all the time. Abigail came into our house, and y'all know she came in with a thunderclap and a whirlwind. That's how she entered, right? Upside down even, but she came in with a thunderclap and a whirlwind. And she came in with a type A personality that didn't mind being mama from, you know, day one. She was calling the shots and putting out schedules and, you know, calling people down instantly. And it didn't take long for the older three to determine we've got to deal with this, right? And so... They began to unite, and, and we're going to work against Abigail. And the next thing you know, boy, everything is outlashing against Abigail. And, and I still remember, you know, we set them down and say, okay, kids, there's something you have to know. We love Abigail too, right? Abigail is pretty important to us. She's one of ours. And we're not going to get rid of her just because she irritates you. In fact, your mother and I laugh at that whenever you go to bed, right? We're not going to get rid of them just because she irritates you a little bit. Do you understand that when you look around the church? 
These are people that God loved so much that even when they didn't love him and even when they didn't care about him or want him, God still loved them so much that he pulled them out of the mud and washed them off and made them alive and put his spirit with them. And his son paid for the debt of all of their sin. God loves them, whether you love them or not. So good luck going to God and talking about how bad they are, right? God loves them. Nick Batzig wrote the key to our loving other believers with brotherly love is to train ourselves to think properly about the other members of the family of God. God calls us to view each and every believer as one for whom Christ died. In Christ, God has laid down his life for the brethren. We too are to lay down our lives for one another. Jesus has patiently borne with us. We too are to bear with one another in love. Jesus has died to forgive us our sins. We too are to forgive one another. Jesus continues to build us up in truth. We too are to build up one another in truth. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for us. We too are to intercede for one another. Jesus has given us every every provision for our lives in this world and the world to come. We too are to share our provisions in lives with one another, both now and for all eternity. That's the calling. You are those whom God has loved. And so is your brother. And God has called you to love him. No, he does not deserve it. Neither did you. And yes, he might irritate you. So did you. He might actually act like your enemy. So were you. You don't love him because he deserves it. You love him because God loves him and God deserves it. Right? That makes sense. Now that's the theological aspect. And I know we're just about out of time. And so you're going to have to listen faster here on the end. That's the theological aspect. But I do not want you to leave here just with a better theology. That misses the point of what John is saying. You don't just walk out of here now. I could pass the test now. If somebody put a test, should you love your brother? Yes, true. Why? Because God loves him. True. That's, not the, that's not the point here. The point is not that you walk out of here knowing that you're supposed to love your brother. What's the point? That you love your brother. That you actually do it. God sent Jesus to people who did not deserve it. He sent him to move us from death to life. He sacrificed himself for our benefit. And now here's the question. How important is your brother's spiritual life to you? That's the question. How important is it to you, your brother's spiritual life? Or are we going to be like Cain? Remember John told us he was of the evil one. And when God came to Cain and said, where's your brother Abel? What was Cain's response? You remember? Am I my brother's keeper? Jesus came in and answered with a resounding yes. I am. I am my brother's keeper. I realize my brother is a wayward, wayward, sinful, nasty soul wallowing in the mud pit. But I am here to love my brother. I am here to love those whom God loves. And Christ came to this filthy, sin-infested planet. And he walked in our filth and he walked in our shame and he saved us out of the muck and the mire. And he took our punishment and he put his life within us so that we might live in a manner that pleases the Father. And the question is, am I willing to do the same? How important is the spiritual life of my brother to me? How much would I sacrifice for my brother to walk in fellowship with God? How important is his physical life to me? And incidentally, we also have to say, don't limit this just to the redeemed. John is talking about loving fellow believers. That's what he's talking about. But I want you to understand, think about those who are the elect who have yet to place their faith in Christ. When Jesus came, did he say, I'm here to love those who have been redeemed? And everybody who has not been redeemed, go away. Is that what he did? What did he do? Something about a lost sheep. Anybody remember anything about a lost sheep? What did he do? He left the 99 to go find it, didn't he? My father has a sheep. My father loves that sheep. Sheep hardly deserves it. That is one dumb sheep, right? It is wayward and traveling. It's got itself in danger. But I'm going to go find that sheep. Go to the lost sons of the house of Israel, is what Jesus told his disciples when he sent them out. Go get your brothers, the lost ones, the unredeemed ones, the ones that God has chosen that are not saved yet. And you say, well, who is that? And the answer is, I don't know, and neither do you. So you're going to have to go tell everybody, right? You're going to have to go tell them all. I don't know who they are, and neither do you. So go to all the world and preach all the gospel, right, that all men should repent and believe in Christ. There must be a missionary commitment here. We must love God enough even to love his wayward sons. The picture is clear, isn't it? I've got one more passage for you, Luke 15. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing, and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, Look, 
For so many years I've been serving you and I've never neglected a command of yours and yet you've never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you have always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. You see it there? That father loves that son, doesn't he? Does the brother love him? No. And he's not asking him to love him because he's lovable. He's not asking to love him because he did right or did good. He says, I love him and I want you to love him because I love him. Will you rejoice for the Father? Will you celebrate for the Father? Will you help your brother for the Father? Will you invest in his life for your Father? Will you get down in the ditch? Will you help him financially? Will you intercede for him? Will you bear his burden? Will you listen to him and help him? Will you confront him and teach him? Will you build him up and train him? Will you love your brother for the Father? John's going to tell you, those who do, Reveal that they know the Father, because that's exactly what he does. And those who don't, reveal that they don't know God. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. We cannot be people who are unconcerned about those whom the Father loves. We have to be people who are consumed with those whom the Father loves. That's the reality. Let's pray. Father, we come to you because you are our God. And first and foremost, God, we tell you thank you for loving us. To have the distinction and title as beloved. God, there's not a title we could love more than to be loved by you. We're so thankful. We also pray, God, that you would help us see that we are not sole possessors of this title. But that you have loved our brothers and you have loved our sisters. Those that sit in this church. Some of our brothers and sisters go to other churches in this same town. Some of our brothers and sisters live in foreign soil, live across the world. God, they're all over the place, and we love them because you love them. Teach us to love them, and not just in sentiment, but to love them the way you loved them. To love them sacrificially, to love them redemptively, to love them as such to be concerned about their life, to intercede for them, to plead for them, to help them, to care for them, to train them and build them up. Teach us to love our brother. Lord God, we thank you for this truth that you've given us, and we do not argue. What you've done for us deserves that we love one another. We thank you so much for Jesus, our brother, who came and loved us. And it's in his name I pray. Amen.